what was happening was in the beginning when I was doing um, the self inquiry, that was long, long time ago. It was still happening from my mind and I was not um, seeing the self at all, yeah. right? And then um, by the grace, I was sitting in front of Ramana's picture in the first hall before yes. the temple. Yes, all right. right. And that's when um, it was pure grace that something just just opened, right? Yes. When there was no mind. Yeah. And that was like, aha. And uh, But since then, my biggest challenge is when I'm meditating, I'm in that space mm. and um, in between. But most of the time, I am still um, in the mind mm. and I get totally engrossed when I'm in the world. The Maya completely takes over. Right. And um, even after knowing it, right? Yes. I can come back to it, but I have to be sitting in silence and meditating. And it also depends on how far I've gone in the world as to how long it will take me to retreat. Right. It may take a few minutes. It may take a couple of hours or it may be instant, depending on how engrossed I am. Uh, of course, good thing is that something in me knows <laughs> what is happening. Right. So how? what are the tips you can give me so I don't go so much and, and grow, get engrossed so much and remain tethered? Okay. Um, there, are, there are two ways of approaching this. Firstly, what we have to understand is what we any anything that comes and goes is not real and not ourself what we actually are is what is always existing and shining clearly as i am so as long as we are um so, so long as our attention is on that which is ever present and ever clear we are that is self attentiveness so anything but um any experience that comes and goes is something other than ourself so our aim is to only attend to that which is ever present not only ever present in waking and dream but present in all the three states so if so long as we're experiencing anything other than what we experience in sleep, that is something other than ourself. So once we understand that it is that ever-present awareness of our fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am, that is what we are trying to meditate on or attend to. That is pr present at all times, whether we, we, we may not be attentive to it, we may, we, we may not be attending to it, but it is always there. We are always clearly aware, I am. Whatever else we may be doing, we, that, 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 that awareness of our own existence, I am, is always there in the background. Generally, in, in normal day-to-day -day life, we are so interested in things other than ourselves but our attention goes out towards other things. So though we continue to be aware I am, we neglect that. We don't, we don't pay attention to it. So to, to put it in, in simple terms, we are always self-aware. But generally, we are negligently self-aware in that we, we, though we are self-aware, we are not taking interest in or take, paying attention to ourselves. So our aim in self-investigation is just to be, instead of being negligently self-aware as we generally are, we are trying to be attentively self-aware. In other words, we, we are trying to, to hold on to that, uh, that awareness of our own existence, I am. 
since that is ever present, we can hold on to it at all times and in all circumstances. There's not, there's no circumstance that can stand in the way of our practicing self-attentiveness. The problem lies not in any external circumstances. And I think this is right, what, you, what coming closer to what you were actually talking about. The problem is our interest in other things. So long as we are interested in other things, concerned about other things, our attention goes out towards them. And to the extent that we attend to other things, we are thereby neglecting ourselves. So we are trying, we are, we, what we are trying to achieve is a shift of our attention. And of course, our attention follows our interest. So we must, uh, there must be a shift in our interest. We need to, we need to lose interest in anything other than ourselves. And how we lose that interest, of course, if we say lose interest, it sounds a negative way of putting it. Bhagavan's part is, a, is not taking a negative approach, but a positive approach. By taking more and more interest in knowing who am I, to the extent we are interested in knowing who am I, our interest in other things will wane. And how do we cultivate that interest, that love to know who am I? by persevering in this practice as much as we can in whatever circumstances. That is, it is good, it is maybe beneficial sometimes to sit or to lie down or uh, in some time when our mind is not, um, when, when there are no other demands, when there seems to be no other demands on our attention, those may be favorable times for trying to go a bit deeper within. But even in the midst of other activities, even in the midst of mental activities, I am is always there in the background. So we must, we must try to cultivate so much interest in knowing who am I, but we continue to be self-attentive even in the midst of other activities. A simple analogy I sometimes give to illustrate this is that supposing uh, a very dear friend of yours was critically ill in the hospital. Supposing they, a, a very dear friend had caught COVID and they're in ICU and the doctors don't know whether they're going to save your friend or not. Because of your love for your friend, whatever else you may be doing, you may be at work, in office, doing whatever, that thought of your friend will be constantly coming to your mind, no matter what other activities you may be doing. Why? Because you're, you've got so much love for your friend, so much concern for your friend, the thought of your friend will be always coming, will be repeatedly coming to your mind, even in the midst of other activities. Likewise, if we have so much interest, so much love to know what we are, even in the midst of other activities, we will, that, that, that self-attentiveness will continue even in the midst of other activities. And if we progress further in this path, go deeper in this path, we will eventually find that actually no other activities require any attention on our part at all. Why? Because, as Bhagavan said, whatever we, what we are to experience in this life is all preordained. It's all predetermined according to what is called prarabdha. That's our destiny or fate. In order for us to experience our destiny, we have to do certain actions. For instance, supposing it's your destiny now to eat a meal, uh, to, 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 to enjoy eating a meal. In order to eat that meal, you've got to put the food in your mouth. So the essential action, the actions that we really need to do in order to experience our destiny, we are made to do. Um, so we don't have to concern ourselves with those actions. If we are attending to ourselves, those actions will go on automatically. When we are not attending to ourselves, what happens? Instead of attending to ourselves, we allow our attention to go outwards. Allowing our attention to go outwards is allowing ourselves to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas. Vishaya Vasanas means Vasanas means inclinations. And vishaya means uh, objects or phenomena. So our inclination to attend to anything other than ourselves, any object or phenomenon, is a vishaya vasana. So 
it's only under the sway of our Vishaya Vasana that we allow our attention to go outwards. When we allow our attention to go outwards, we can be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas to a greater or lesser extent. That is, we, we, we can, we, Vasanas are inclinations, so we are never bound by our inclinations. We just have a, we, we generally, we follow our inclinations, but often we have contrary in, inclinations. For example, we like to eat a tasty meal, but we know that eating too much is not good for us. So though we would like to eat more, we have an inclination to eat more, we also have an inclination to restrain ourselves, because we know that if I eat too much, I'll, I'll not feel well. So we've got two conflicting inclinations. So we are free to choose whether to follow it, this inclination or that inclination, like that, throughout, so long as we're allowing our mind to go outwards, we're being swayed one way or another by our Vishaya Vasanas, but we are free to choose which Vasanas we allow ourselves to be swayed by and which Vasanas we don't allow ourselves to be swayed by. So when we, are be, when we allow our mind to be swayed by our, its Vishaya Vasanas, that gives rise to thoughts, and thoughts give rise to actions, uh, they give rise to speech and actions of the body. So, uh, we, so long as we are allowing our attention to go away from ourselves, we are inevitably acting by mind, speech, and body under the sway of our vasanas. Those actions that we do under the sway of our vasanas are what are called agamya, that is, the actions we do of our own will. So at the same time, our mind, speech, and body is being driven. Certain actions we have to do in accordance with our prarabdha, those actions we're made to do. But in the midst of doing those actions, we're also doing so many other actions. And even, for example, I gave that example. If it's your destiny to eat a, a tasty meal, you will, you, 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 your, you will be made to put that food in your mouth because you can't avoid that destiny. But generally when we eat a tasty meal, we do so with desire. I want to eat a tasty meal. I like this meal. So even when we are doing actions according to our destiny, we are also doing actions according to our, driven by our basanas. And in other words, actions according to our will. So they're going on side by side. So we cannot stop those actions which we are destined to do. And we need not stop them because they don't affect us in any way. What is destined to happen is going to happen. If we are not concerned about it, then we need not be concerned about destiny at all because it's going to happen anyway. We can't stop it. We can't change it. So what we are to experience, we cannot change. What we are to do in order to experience it, we cannot change. What we can change is at the level of vasanas. Do we allow our mind to be swayed by vasanas and thereby get caught up in doing actions of mind, speech, and body according to under the sway of our vasanas? Or do we refrain from being swayed by our vasanas by clinging firmly to I am? The more we cling to I am, the more we will come to understand that our attention is not necessary for any action. That is, whatever, des whatever be the destiny of this body, speech, and mind, we have th this body, speech, and mind have to undergo that destiny. So they will be made to do the actions that are necessary to experience that. We experience it only when we allow our mind to go outwards. That's why Bhagavan often used to say, prarabdha affects only the outward turned mind. It cannot prevent us turning our mind within. So our aim now is to turn our mind within and be unconcerned about everything outside. To the extent to which we have a love to know ourselves, we will be unconcerned about other things. On the other hand, to the extent that we are concerned about other things, interested in other things, we will be, have less interest in knowing what we ourselves actually are. So the, the whole aim of our, of our practice is to wean our mind off its Vishaya Vasanas and to cultivate the opposite type of vasana, which is what is called sat vasana. Sat means being. So sat vasana is the inclination just to be. In other words, the inclination to know and to be what we actually are. That is what is otherwise called bhakti. That's true bhakti, the love just to, to be as we actually are. That is the, the purest form of bhakti.
So we are cultivating bhakti and weakening our inclination to go outwards. In other words, the weakening of our inclination to go outwards is what is called vairagya. So we are cultivating bhakti and vairagya by this practice of self-attentiveness. So it's a process. We, because we still have, so long as we still have strong vishaya vasanas, we cannot just give them up overnight. We need, we need to slowly, slowly weaken them by this practice. So while when we're practicing self-attentiveness, we, we, we are undergoing a process, a process which is sometimes called a process of purification. Because the impurities in the mind are the vishaya vasanas. To the extent that we weaken the vishaya vasanas, our mind is thereby said to be purified. So we are undergoing a process. When, when we, it's a process of growth, we can say. When you're growing, or, or let, uh, to give an analogy, see a small child learning to walk. If, when, when the child first starts to walk, they'll toddle a few steps and fall down. And then they'll get up and toddle a few more steps and fall down. No child is ever put off by the number of times it falls down. There's no, it's just not the nature of a child to give up. The child will go on trying until eventually it, it gets the hang of uh, walking steadily without, uh, without um, falling over. So like that, we have to just to persevere. It doesn't matter how many times we fail, how many times our mind gets dragged outwards, doesn't matter. When we notice it's been dragged outwards, what do we do? We turn it back within. What? The mind goes out towards other things. Those other things that the mind is going to are just appearances. To whom do they appear? To me. Thereby we turn our attention back to ourselves. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think you mentioned earlier about asking the question, who am I? Though Bhagavan has given clues in the form of questions, he never asked us the question to, to ask or question uh, to whom is this thought or who am I? What he said is investigate to whom is this thought, investigate who am I? So it's, this is an investigation. The, the questions are clues. And sometimes it may be helpful to us when we find our attention is, is dragged away and taking interest in so many other things. To whom do all these things appear? Just to remind ourselves to, to, to turn our attention back towards ourselves. But what the clue means is that Bhagavan isn't asking us to ask the question. Bhagavan is, is giving us a clue. Whatever may appear, to whom does it appear? Or only to me. So we think the appearance of other things distracts our attention. But we can't blame those other things. It's why they distract our attention? Because we're interested in them. If we, if we really are interested in knowing ourselves, whatever appears should remind us, oh, this has appeared. To whom does it appear? To me. So we turn our attention back to ourselves. So rather than taking the appearance of other things to be a distraction, we can take it to be a reminder. Or oh, our attention has slipped away from ourself, we need to turn it back to ourselves. So this, 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 as I say, this is a process and it requires perseverance and patience to succeed. Just like a small child has to persevere patiently and eventually it succeeds in walking steadily. Thank you, Michael, for explaining it so eloquently and so thoroughly. Um, the question I have is, you mentioned that uh, when you're in the self, the things which is your prarabdha would happen automatically. Is, is that it'll take care, if I'm established in the self, but you're working, for instance, in a corporate world, right? So yes. does that stop when you're established, it takes care of your basic, you know, eating and walking and all that, or, you know, major projects that you have to participate in? Whether, um, mm -hmm. whether so if are, you could speak to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whether we are established in ourself or not, what is destined to happen is going to happen. So if it's your destiny to work in the corporate world, 
uh, you will work in the corporate world. That, that the mind speech and body will work in the corporate world. But the problem is now we identify ourselves as a certain person. I am such and such a person. That, that a name like I am Michael. Michael is the name of a of a person. A person means a body, a mind, a bundle of five sheets, as Bhagavan would put it. This person is not what we actually are. But when we allow our attention to go away from ourselves, we seem to be this person. And so we feel, I am working, I am doing something, I, am, I have such and such a position in the corporate world, I have responsibilities, I have to take care of all these things, these all require a lot of my attention. It, it, yes, it seems to us that the actions we do require attention. But the truth is, well, the deeper truth revealed by Bhagavan is actually it doesn't require your attention at all. If it's destined to happen, it will happen and you'll be, des you'll be made to do those actions whether you attend to it or not. If it's not destined to happen, it's not going to happen anyway. So our attending to things other than ourselves does not have any impact on what is going to happen because what is going to happen is already predetermined. By attending to other things, as I say, we allow us, we are allowing ourselves to be swayed by our Bishaya Vasanas, and thereby we are constantly acting according to that if Bishaya Vasanas give rise to likes and dislikes. Likes and dislikes give rise to desires, attachments, hopes, fears, and so on. And they'll give rise to more thoughts, which give rise to actions, and so on and so forth. So we but by allowing ourselves to be uh, swayed by our vasanas, we are not in the slightest changing what is destined to happen. Because what is destined to happen is going to happen. It cannot, it cannot, uh, it cannot stop. We cannot stop it in any way. And we, we, cannot, we cannot experience anything that we are not destined to experience. And we cannot avoid experiencing anything that we are destined to experience. Oh, well. Except by turning our attention within, we cannot avoid experiencing it. That is what this body, speech, and mind are to undergo. That is already predetermined at the time this body came into existence. That doesn't mean that all the people naively assume when Bhagavan says this, oh, that means all our actions are predestined. That is not what Bhagavan said. We are acting under the sway of our vasanas, but whatever actions we do under the sway of our vasanas, is only creating fresh karma, what is called agamya, which is what bears fruit, which is later experienced in a later life as, uh, as, as prarabdha, as destiny. So we are free to, to, to want things that are no, not destined to happen, and we are free to try to uh, achieve those things, but we are not free to achieve them. Only what is destined to happen is going to happen. So applying this to your question no, about could the you, corporate could world. You, could you explain that, Michael, a little bit further? Okay. That this okay. is not what, okay. um, because that's what I understood, but you're saying that's not what right. Bhagavan said. No, that's mm -hmm. not. That is, uh, I'll, to, to explain this, I'll just, I'll give a brief outline of the law mm -hmm. of karma as it was taught by Bhagavan. That is, there are three types of karma what are called agamya, sanchita, and prarabdha. I'll explain what these mean. Actually, the karma means action. The only karma is the agamya. The, um, the sanchita and the prarabdha are not karma as such. They are karma pala, the fruit of action. But generally, they're all referred to collectively as karma, the three karmas. So, agamya is those actions we do according to our will. In other words, those actions we do under the sway of our vasanas. Those actions we do by mind, speech, and body, they bear fruit. Those fruit we cannot experience in this lifetime, because what is we're destined to experience in this lifetime has already been predetermined. So the fruits of all the actions we do in this lifetime get stored. The store of fruits that we haven't yet experienced are called sanchita. Sanchita means a heap or a pile. So the, the pile of the fruits 
of past actions that we've not yet experienced are called sanchita. At the beginning of each life, that is, at the beginning of the life of each body, uh, God or Guru will select from that sanchita uh, those uh, fruit that we are to experience in this lifetime. That selection is made to suit our present level of spiritual development. In other words, the, um, the prarabdha is tailor-made to suit our vasanas. And so what, what, is, what, is, what we are to experience, everything that we experience now is the fruit of karmas that we've done in the past. So this is all, all our destiny is karma pala. Karma pala simply means the, the fruit of, of actions we've done in the past. So, and in order to experience that, as I say, certain actions we need to do in order to experience it, those actions we are, we are made to do according to, in accordance with our destiny. That doesn't mean that all the actions we do are in accordance with destiny, because it's very obvious that the vast majority of actions we do are driven by our vasanas. But if supposing we cling so firmly to self-attentiveness, but we don't allow ourselves to be swayed even to the slightest extent by any vasanas, any vishaya vasanas, we will therefore not be doing any agamya. And therefore, whatever actions are done by our mind, speech, and body will be in accordance with prarabdha. But in practice, that doesn't happen because so long as there's ego, that it is the nature of ego to have vishaya vasanas. So we cannot be totally free of vishaya vasanas until we eradicate ego, because ego is the root. So long as the root is there, the, the the, the share of asanas will also be there along with it. So we cannot, we cannot be to completely free of the share of asanas. So until ego is e eradicated, inevitably, we will, to a greater or lesser extent, be swayed by our share of asanas. We cling to self-attentiveness, and then again, our attention slips away towards other things under the sway of the share of asanas. So, um, so in practice, even, even, even when we are very seriously following this path, we are still doing agamya to a little limited extent. In other words, we're still acting, we're still allowing our mind to be swayed by vishaya vasanas. Um, but we need not be concerned about that. Our aim is we want to try as much as possible to wean our mind off its off our vishaya vasanas by clinging. Uh, just, all we need to do is to cling to I. The more we cling to I, the more we're weaning ourselves off our vishaya vasanas. So, uh, as I say, those, uh, the destiny will not be impacted, even in the slightest, by our turning within. Because what it's already predetermined, it's going to go on. And so the actions of mind, speech, and body, which are necessary in order for us to experience prarabdha, will also go on. So. If it is your destiny to work in the corporate world, obviously working in the corporate world requires actions of mind, speech, and body. Those mm -hmm. actions you will be made to do. You need not be concerned about those. All you need to do is cling to I. If you cling to I so firmly, that is, you need not allow your attention to go at all towards the actions of the body, speech, and mind, because that's Will be that, that that will be taken care of by in accordance with prarabdha. They'll be made to act uh, in whatever way is necessary. So, uh, but, but obviously in practice, we none of us are able to achieve that degree of um, of uh, steadiness in self attentiveness. Right? If we could achieve that degree, that would be the end of the story. Ego would be finished. But, so we're working towards that. When we're working towards that, we are inevitably still, to a greater or lesser extent, being swayed by our vishaya vasanas. So we're trying to wean the mind off its vishaya vasanas, to reduce the extent to which we are swayed by our vishaya vasanas. So let me not worry about our destiny, because that's already, that's predetermined, we cannot change that. We need not worry about those actions which we are meant to do according to destiny, because we will be made to do those. 
we need not worry about other actions. We need not even worry about the agamya. Why? Because we cannot tell which actions are agamya, which are prarabdha, or which are a mixture of both. Mm. All we, what we need to do is to work at the level of the vishayabhasanas. If we take care of the vishayabhasanas, we will automatically be, that is, to the extent that we curb our vishayabhasanas, to the extent that we avoid being swayed by our vishayabhasanas, we will thereby avoid doing agamya. So we, people say, how do I know whether such and such an action is agamya or prarabdha? You, you cannot mm -hmm. know and you need not know. Once um, uh, a, a very uh, nice, a good devotee called Ramasami Palai, he, he was with Bhagavan for many, many years. And um, he used to be called Saiko Swami because if anything was needed, if, if anything wasn't available in the ashram, and he heard about it. He'd once hop on his cycle and go to a town and buy it and bring it back. And he did a lot of service. The, the pathway uh, from Raman Ashram up to Skandashram, he single-handedly laid all the stones for that path over a long period wow. of time. So he was a very good devotee, Bhagavan, but very enthusiastic about serving people. Once he asked Bhagavan, Bhagavan, how do we know which actions we are destined to do and which actions are, uh, uh, are according to our, our, our gamya, according to our will. Um, Bhagavan said, whatever, whatever action you feel inclined to do, reject it, reject it, reject it, reject it. And what comes and sits on your head, in spite of you rejecting it, is what you're destined to do. Mm. So what, but I mean, that, that's, a, that's um, that was the appropriate answer in that case. But if you want to apply that, the, the most effective way to apply that advice is to, is to deal with the Vishaya Vasanas. That is, how do actions of, of speech and um, body are driven by the actions of the mind? The actions of the mind our thoughts, which are the sprouting of our vishayabhasana. So as soon as we allow ourselves to be swayed by our vishayabhasana, our mind comes outwards in the form of thoughts. So we, we, that's why Bhagavan said, at the very place from which they arise, we need to, we need to crush these vishayabhasanas. That is, Bhagavan has explained this very, very clearly in there are two paragraphs in Nana, the, the, these are possibly the two most important paragraphs from, from, the, from the practice point of view, uh, paragraphs 10 and 11. That is, they're right in the heart of, all the, of Nana, because Nana consists of 20 paragraphs. So the middle two mm -hmm. paragraphs deal with this subject of Vishaya Vasanas. Uh, what Bhagavan says there is, in the 10th paragraph, he says, even though Vishaya Vasanas and remember, Vishaya Vasanas means our inclination to attend to or to experience anything other than ourself, any Vishaya, in other words, any object or phenomena. Even though Vishaya Vasanas, which come from time immemorial, rise as countless numbers like ocean waves, they will all be destroyed when Swarupa Dhyana increases and increases. Swarupa Dhyana literally means meditation on our own nature. In other words, being self-attentiveness, it means, mm. so, what it implies. So, so to be, to be extent, that is, all these Vishaya Vasana, however many of them, they are always rising. They're always naturally, it's the nature of Vishaya Vasana is to rise and draw our attention away from ourselves. So if we cling to uh, Swarupa Dhyana, to self-attentiveness, they will be destroyed. So he said, they will all be destroyed when Swarupa Jnana increases and increases. Increasing increases means, implies in, in um, duration and depth and intensity. So the more we are self-attentive, the more the Vishaya Vasanas will be weakened and destroyed. Then in the next uh, sentence, he says, without giving room, even to the doubting thoughts, um, uh, Putting in, uh, dissolving so many vasanas, is it possible to be to remain only a swarupa? It is necessary to in, instead of 
giving room to that doubt and thought, it is necessary to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. In Tamil, he said that um, that clause, it is necessary to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. It's, it's expressed very, very, in a very powerful, forceful way in Tamil. Swarupa dhyana te vidha pidiyai pidika bendam. Vidha pidiyai means, vidha means without leaving. Pidiyai means uh, clingingly. Uh, pidika bendam, it's necessary to cling, clingingly, without leaving. So it, it, that gives the idea of clinging tenaciously to self-attentiveness. So without giving room to any, any other thoughts, even the thought, is it possible or not to to, to achieve this, we, all we need to do is to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. And then in the next sentence, he says, uh, however great a sinner one may be, instead of lamenting and weeping, I, I am a sinner, how am I going to be saved? If one completely rejects the thought that one is a sinner and is zealous or steadfast in self-attentiveness, one will certainly be reformed. Well, or implied that one will certainly be saved. So we, all we need to do is to cling to self-attentiveness. That's what he says in the 10th paragraph. Then in the 11th paragraph, he continues the same subject. He says, as long as the share of asanas exist within the mind, so long is the investigation, who am I necessary? That is, the share of asanas will exist in the mind, so long as ego exists. Because, as I said, it's the nature of ego to... Um, to to have the share of asanas because ego is always going out with clinging to other things because ego can't survive without clinging to things other than itself. So the share of asanas is the very nature of ego. So when he says as long as the share of asanas exists within the mind, the implication is until ego is eradicated, so long is the investigation who are mine necessary. And then he says in the next sentence, second sentence, as and when thoughts appear. Thoughts are just the sprout. I, sorry, I'm just adding this as an explanation. Thoughts are the sprouting of our Vishay of Asanas. So he says, as and when thoughts appear, then and there it is necessary to annihilate them all by Vicharana in the very place from which they arise. Vicharana means uh, investigation. It implies self-attentiveness. What he referred to in the previous paragraph as Swarupa Dhyana, he refers to here as Vicharana. So how do we annihilate them all? He, he says, annihilate them in the very place from which they arise. What does that mean? If we allow, our, if we allow the vasana to rise and to carry our attention away from ourselves, it's already left it the place from which it rose. So in order to annihilate it in the, the vasana is in the very place from which they arose, we need to cling firm, firmly to self-attentiveness. If we cling so firmly to self-attentiveness, we don't allow, but we so uh, if we cling so uh, firmly, but we don't allow ourselves to be swayed by our vasanas, we are thereby annihilating them in the very place from which they arose. That's what he means here. And then in the next sentence, he says, "Not attending to anything other that implies anything other than oneself is veragya. Veragya means dispassion or detachment." or nirasa, desirelessness. Not leaving or not letting go of oneself is jnana. In truth, these two, vairagya and jnana, are just one. That is, uh, if we don't leave ourselves, if we cling to ourselves so firmly, but we don't leave ourselves, that is jnana. And if we're clinging to ourselves, we're not attending to anything else, that is vairagya. That's why he says they're one and the same. And then in the next sentence, he gives an analogy. Just as pearl divers, tying stones to their waists and sinking, pick up pearls that are found at the bottom of the ocean, so each one, sinking deep within oneself with their agia, may obtain the pearl of oneself. So he says here, we, he compares here Varagya to the stone that a pearl diver dives to, ties to their waist. In order to sink deep enough to, to get the pearls at the bottom of the ocean, the pearl divers need to tie stones to their waist. Likewise, in order to sink deep enough within ourselves to attain the pearl of, of self, the Atmamutu, the pearl of ourself, uh, we need to, we need to, uh, 
have intent veragya, that is, we need to be free of desire to be aware of anything other than ourselves. In other words, we, we must have so much love to attend only to ourselves. And if we do so, we will thereby sink deep within ourselves, and thereby we will attain the pearl of, 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 one, of self. That's a, obviously an analogy. That means we, we will know what we actually are. And then in the next sentence, he says, this is also a very important sentence. If one clings fast to uninterrupted Swarupa Smarana until one attains Swarupa, that alone is sufficient. Swarupa means one's own real nature, in other words, what we actually are. And a Swarupa Smarana means remembrance of that, in other words, self remembrance. In other words, self remembrance is just another way of saying self attentiveness. So if we cling fast to uninterrupted self attentiveness until we attain our real nature, that alone is sufficient. So nothing else is necessary. All we need to do is to try more and more to cling to self-attentiveness. And the more interrupted our self-attentiveness is, the faster we will proceed to our goal. Uh, but we shouldn't be discouraged if we're not able to hold on to it uninterrupted at first, because, as I say, this is a process. We, we, it, uh, just like a child learning to walk doesn't get discouraged because it falls over many times, we shouldn't be discouraged by our failures. The road to success is paved with failure. Someone who's never failed has ne will never succeed. We all have to fail in order to succeed. Um, but it's a practice. It's a, it's a, 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 a patient and persistent practice is absolutely necessary. And then in the last two sentences of this paragraph, he gives a beautiful analogy. So long as enemies are within the fortress, they'll be continuously coming out from it. If one is continuously cutting down all of them, as and when they come, the fortress will eventually be captured. So what, what does this mean? He hasn't said, he's just talking about uh, enemies coming out of fortress. What does he mean by this? That is, the fortress is our own heart. The enemies in that fortress are our vasanas. Um, so they will be constantly, so long as they're in our heart, they'll be constantly coming out. Why are they constantly coming out? Because, that is, um, we, we can elaborate upon this analogy a bit. The enemies Bhagavan is talking about here are, are Vishaya Vasanas. The Vishaya Vasanas are like an army. The commander-in-chief of that army is ego. So ego so long as ego has a strong army of Vishaya Vasanas, we, our ultimate aim is to annihilate ego, to eradicate ego, because that's what stands between us and knowing ourselves as we actually are. So, but we cannot annihilate ego so long as it's got a strong army of Vishaya Vasanas. So, but the ego and, uh, and its army of Vishaya Vasanas have captured the fortress of our heart. So in order to recapture the fortress of our heart, we need to besiege that fortress. And if we're besieging it, we are how do we besiege the fortress? By clinging firmly to self-attentiveness. So long as we are clinging firmly to self-attentiveness, we are not giving room for the enemies to come out of the fortress. But they cannot remain in the fortress because Ego and its Vishaya Vasanas, they just like if, a, if an army is, uh, is surrounded in a fortress and has no food and water, if they've got plenty of food and water, they don't have to come out. They can safely stay inside the fortress. Mm -hmm. But in this case, they don't have any food and water in the fortress. That is, ego and its Vasanas depend on the food of our attention. That is, we seem to be ego only so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves. So ego depends upon the food of our attending to other things. And the vasanas are our inclinations to attend to other things. So ego and its army of Vishaya vasanas depend upon the food of our attention to things other than ourselves. Because they don't have that food in the fortress, they have to come out. So the vasanas are constantly coming out, trying to distract our attention away from ourselves. 
if they succeed in distracting our attention away from ourselves, they thereby got some food and water and they can retreat back into a fortress um, until they, they again become hungry and again have to come out again. So, so long as we are self-attentive, so long as we're trying to be self-attentive, vasanas will constantly be trying to come out in order to distract our attention away from ourselves. So Bhagavan says in the final sense, if one is continuously cutting them, cutting all of them down, as and when they come, the fortress will eventually be captured. So how do we cut them down? By clinging firmly to self-attentiveness. So long as we are clinging firmly to self-attentiveness, they cannot survive. So they grow weaker and weaker and weaker. And eventually we can enter the fortress and kill the ego and reclaim our heart as our own rightful property. So it's a beautiful analogy Bhagavan gives here and so, so apt. Super beautiful. Um, digressing it a little bit from this topic. Thank you yes. so much, uh, Michael. So one of the analogy that I struggled with um, that Bhagavan has given is about the three states, right? The waking, yeah. the dream. My question is when we wake up from a dream, yes. right? It's um, it's clear, and the reason is one, we don't see the same dream again, right? That dreams yes. are different every time we sleep. Yes. So it's easy to establish that what we saw was not real, and we feel yes. relieved. Yes. But in yes. the waking state, we always come back to the same people, <laughs> same drama. Yes. So it's much more challenging to established that this too is a dream from consciousness perspective okay. so could you speak to that a little yes, bit yes that is um the reason we come back it's the same every day when we wake up is that the whole of our present life is one dream this one dream is interrupted by periods of sleep and also by periods of uh small dreams within the bigger dream. Um, moreover, the differences we see, when that, now you point out a difference, that this way we keep on coming back to the same state. This difference seems to be the case only from the perspective of this present waking state. When we are dreaming, we seem to be awake. Supposing we were having this discussion in your dream last night, you you will be talking, you will be saying, you'll be referring to this wake, you'll be referring to a dream as this waking state. Because whenever we are dreaming, we seem to be awake. And also, when we are dreaming, what is it that, that gives us seeming continuity to our waking, to our waking state? Why do we say, oh, this is, this is a continuation of what I was experiencing yesterday, which is a continuation of what I was experiencing the day before? It is memory. So memory gives us that impression that, there's a, that, this, is a, this, that this life is following a, a, a regular pattern. That, that what happened yesterday determines what happens today, which will determine what happens tomorrow. There seems to be a sequence of events. So it all seems to be consistent. But in dream, we also seem to remember. Like in dream, we can remember our childhood. We can remember so many things about our life. So it, and sometimes things happen in dream that surprise us. We, we know some friend or relative or parent or someone has died many, many years ago, but they appear in our dream. And we think, oh, I thought this person was dead, but the dream is so real that we think, oh, there must be some mistake. Maybe they didn't die or maybe somehow they come back again. We, we, we easily reconcile our mind to the fact that because we see the person there, there is re that is, we are taking ourselves to be a body, and that person is just as real as the body we seem to be. So it is definitely my my old friend or my father or my mother who passed away so many years ago. I'm now seeing. So the the waking from the perspective of dream, though sometimes surprising things happen, it all seems very consistent, and it all 
it all, we have memories, so we can say yes, this isn't a dream. I will, I'm a, I'm awake because I can remember I can remember what I did last year. I can remember what I did as a child. So this is a con this, this is a continuity. So this isn't a dream. That is what we would be arguing if we were in a dream because it's that's how it seems to us in the dream. What is it? So. So now we need to consider, to understand this more deeply, we need to consider why does a dream seem to be real so long as we're experiencing it? What is actually real is only ourself. When we are dreaming, we experience a dream body as ourself. So because we are real, that dream body seems to be real. That is, if this body is I, I am real. So if this body is I, then this body must be real. And this body is a part of this world. So the whole world seems to be uh, real. So the reason a dream seems to be real so long as we are dreaming is that because we are identified with a dream body, so that dream body seems to be real, and hence the whole dream world seems to be real. When we wake up, that is when we leave one dream and come to another dream, the, our identification with the body in the previous dream is, is severed. We no, we no longer experience that dream body as I, because now this body is I. It's not, I'm not that body, I'm this body. So because our identification with that dream body is severed, as soon as it's severed, we're able to recognize, oh, it was just a dream. It was just my own mental uh, fabrication. It wasn't real. So likewise, why this state seems to be so real is because we are taking this body to be ourself. So long as we experience this body as ourself, because we are real, the body seems to be real. And this body, the, the body cannot be real and the rest of the world unreal, but the body is just a small part of this world. So if this body is real, the whole world is real. So whatever state we are currently in, we all, always seems to us to be real. That's why Bowen said, the, uh, whatever happens in dream seems as, just as real as whatever is happening in this present state. So there's actually no difference between them. So, Michael, it's much more easier when we wake up from our dream to sever that connection. Why yes. is it even yes. after knowing the self? at least after having experienced it, why it's so much more challenging to... Um... Um, we think it is challenging. It, it seems to be challenging because of our attachment to this body. But, but uh, even if we're not following the spiritual path, a day will come when we'll have to say goodbye to this body. When death comes, we are, our connection with this body is severed. Every night when we fall asleep, our connection with this body is severed. So it's not actually so easy, but, we, <laughs> what, but the trouble is when our connection with the body is severed, we leave one body and we grasp another body, or we subside into a state like sleep, which is a state of manolea, from which we again rise in. But what we are seeking is not a state of temporary dissolution of mind, like sleep or samadhi or whatever whatever, or coma, or any of these states, these are all temporary dissolution of mind. What we, that's called manolea. What we are seeking is permanent dissolution of mind. That's manonasa, destruction of mind. The reason, why is it that when we fall asleep, but we do, the, the ego isn't thereby destroyed? Because in sleep, what are we experiencing? We're experiencing just pure awareness. We're experiencing only I am in sleep. So why is, why is what the I am that we experience in sleep, why does that not destroy ego? The reason is because the ego is absent. That is, what happens when we fall asleep? Why do we fall asleep? Because we are too tired to continue projecting this dream. So when we, when we are sufficiently tired, we cannot remain awake any longer, so we stop projecting this dream. In other words, we cease attending to anything other than ourselves, and thereby we subside in sleep. There what happens is we cease attending to other things. As a result of not attending to other things, ego subsides. And as a result of ego subsiding, pure awareness alone remains. That, so 
because ego is absent in sleep, it cannot be destroyed. If supposing um, supposing someone is um, convicted of mass murder and the court sentences them to death, but that sentence cannot be carried out unless the convict is present. If a convict has gone AWOL, if he's escaped from <laughs> prison and on the run, though he both court has said a uh, death sentence, <laughs> you, he can't be killed because he's, he's not available. Likewise, ego goes AWOL in sleep. It's not, it's not available, so it can't be destroyed. So how do we bring about the destruction of ego? That is, in sleep, ego dissolves, and then we experience pure awareness. And what? We, it, even say we experience. Ego dissolves, and what remains is pure awareness. But ego doesn't experience that pure awareness because it's already dissolved. So in the waking or dream state, ego itself needs to experience that pure awareness. Because only when ego experiences itself as pure awareness will it be destroyed. Why? Because ego is nothing but the false awareness. I am this body. I am this person. So, so because ego is a false awareness, it can be destroyed only by correct awareness. In other words, only by being aware of itself as it actually is, it can be destroyed. So that is why in order to eradicate ego, here in the waking or dream states, we need to practice self-investigation. That is, we are trying to turn our attention back to ourselves, to face ourselves alone, to, to see ourselves alone. When we, when we attend to ourselves so keenly, that our attention is thereby withdrawn from everything else, then we are aware of nothing other than ourselves. When we as ego are aware of nothing other than ourselves, we are then aware of ourselves as pure awareness. But ego, could, ego cannot experience itself as pure awareness because as soon as it experiences itself as pure awareness, it is thereby dissolved. Because Ego is nothing but the false awareness I am. As soon as ego experiences pure awareness, it is thereby swallowed by that pure awareness. So it's in the waking and dream state that we as ego need to experience ourselves with pure awareness. As soon as we experience ourselves with pure awareness, we cease to be ego. But in, in the case of sleep or coma or Nibhikalpa um, Samadhi or any of these states, they're states of Manolea because first ego is dis dissolved and then what remains is pure awareness. But before the ego is dis that ego needs to be dissolved by pure awareness, by experiencing pure awareness, by experiencing itself as pure awareness. That's very well explained, Michael. One of the comments you made, and if you could explain that, hmm that in the waking state it's one long dream that's why yes Could you speak to that well, but, but the whole of, yeah. the whole of our present life is one dream mm -hmm. and we okay. can also say the whole of the life of the of of ego with one life after another life after another life you can take that as an even bigger dream but uh, um it, so there are dreams within dreams within dreams. But, so it shows but, but continuity. That's well, why it shows continuity. That's to why it shows us. continuity. But uh, whatever be the dream, the dreamer is always the same. And the, the, dream, the dream exists in whose view? Only in the view of the dreamer. So what we need to investigate, we don't need to investigate the dream. That, what, what are scientists doing? They're investigating the dream. They're learning so much about distant planets and about the small, small uh, particles and uh, uh, all, all these uh, quantum effects and all these things. They are making research on the dream. If you want to know the truth, don't investigate the dream. Investigate the dreamer. Because the, the dream depends for its seeming reality upon the dreamer. It's only in the view of the dreamer that the dream seems to exist. So if we investigate the dreamer and we know the truth of the dreamer, then we will know the truth of the dream. Until then, so long as we are investigating, the dream is just objects. So long as you investigate objects, 
The more you investigate objects, the more objects you find. The further they look into distant space, the more and more uh, galaxies and things they find. The more they look down into the, uh, into the constituents of physical matter, they find more and more subtle particles and, and quantum effects and all these things. They, they're just finding more and more objects. Whatever you research on other than yourself, you can make research on history or you can make research on philosophy or geography or so many things. Anything other than yourself, the more you research on it, the more you find objects, the more you find things other than yourself. So there's no end to the research we can do on objects, on the dream. But if we want to take to a research which will have a which will have a final and conclusive reach a final and conclusive uh, um, uh, uh, discovery, we need to investigate ourselves. Who am I to whom this dream appears? If we investigate ourselves and know what we ourselves actually are, we will know that we were never a dreamer. Because the dreamer is only ego. Ego is only a false awareness of ourself as I am this body. That is, that which is aware of itself as I am this body is ego. That is a false awareness of ourself. When we're aware of ourselves as we actually are, we will know there never was any ego. In other words, there never was any dreamer, and therefore there never were any dreams. So the ultimate truth is ajata. Nothing has ever come into existence. What, what is alone? is as it is without ever undergoing any change and we are that oh my god it's so beautiful <laughs> um one last question for you yeah. i know thank you so much michael for spending time with me is that um we have five senses right through yes. which we are experiencing the world yes right and it seems because of what, which these experiences are happening in the body, like what's listening to your words right now. But yeah. I have uh, heard people saying it's actually happening in consciousness. So could you speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah, there's a lot of confusion about this. It's happening. Yeah. It's happening in the mind. The mind, is, mind or ego. That is mind or ego is not the original consciousness. It is what is called chit. The, the pure consciousness is called chit. The pure consciousness is just that fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. That is pure consciousness. The consciousness in which all these things appear is called mind, which is often described as chitabhasa. A basa, uh, often chitabhasa is translated as reflection of consciousness, but the deeper meaning is it's a semblance of consciousness. That is, it's a likeness of consciousness. It's not real consciousness. Why is that? Because ego is always aware of things other than itself. And it's always aware of itself as I am this body, as, as one of the other things that it is aware of. It takes itself to be that. That is, that is a false awareness because nothing other than ourself actually exists. Neither this body nor any of the other phenomena we, uh, we experience actually exist. They merely seem to exist in the view of ego. So ego is a false awareness. It is a semblance or a likeness of awareness. That is why it's called chitabhasa. It's also, a basa also means a reflection. Because when you look in the mirror and see your reflection, what do you see? You're seeing a semblance of yourself, a likeness of yourself. The face you see in the mirror is not yourself, but it looks exactly like yourself. Like that, ego is not a real awareness, it's a semblance of awareness. So it's only in this semblance of awareness that everything appears, including the body. But because we, as ego, seem to have limited ourselves in this body, it seems that we are residing in this body, and through these five senses, these five windows, we are seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling the world. But according to Bhagavan, the world is nothing but these five kinds of sense impressions. He says in verse 6 of Bhuludunaptu, the world is nothing but the five kinds of sense impressions. There, Andrew, nothing else. It's not anything else. So there is no world 
except for the uh, perceptual, the sense impressions we have, the sight, sounds, touch, uh, tactile sensations, uh, tastes, and smells. Apart from this, there is no such thing as world. Um, how can we establish that understanding in us? By persevering in the practice of self-investigation. Because um, when, we, mm -hmm. when, we, when we are investigating ourselves, we are turning our attention back to the original light, the light of pure awareness, which is always shining in our heart as I. So the more we attend to I, the more our mind is, so to speak, bathed in clarity. So Bhagavan's teachings become clearer and clearer to us the more we put them into practice. Not only do they become clearer, they also become simpler. Because ultimately, Bhagavan, the, the ultimate truth is extremely simple. The ultimate truth is one only without a second. There cannot be anything simpler than one. So, uh, so Bhagavan's teachings are extremely simple. The problem for us we come with a complicated mind, with so many ideas and so many beliefs, and we believe that I'm, yes, I'm this person, I'm such and such a person called Michael, and uh, I was born at such and such time, I'm going to die at such and such time, there's this world, this world was there long before I was born, it's going to be there long. We believe so many things, and it's difficult to, to wean our mind, to, to, to free ourselves from these deeply rooted beliefs. So. Uh, reading and thinking carefully about Bhagavan's teachings can help, but the real clarity, the real understanding can come only from practice. Merely reading Bhagavan's teachings and trying to understand them intellectually, our understanding will be very, very superficial. So the more we put them into practice, the deeper our, our understanding will become, the deeper and clearer and simpler it will become. So, Michael, why are we, um, why as, um, you know, the whole humanity, yeah. why are we going backwards and forwards? Meaning, first we send, go to school and learn there's a world, there's, um, you're given a name, others are given a name, all that. Mm -hmm. And now with these teachings, we are doing a reversal of all that. Yes. So but, why not in the first place um, talk about the reality? Sometimes when people came to Bhagavan and asked, show me the way, he said, go back the way you came. That is, we have, we have, as ego, we have risen out of our, out of the heart, out, so to speak. Now, of course, we can never leave the heart, the heart, everything is contained in the heart. The heart means the infinite awareness that we actually are. But as ego, we seem to have come out. So, mm -hmm. in, in order to, we, we need to go back the way we came, as Bhagavan often said. We need to, we, we, we rose by looking outwards. We need to go back in by looking inwards. How has it been for you to put these into practice? And from your personal experience, I think um, for me, what advice as, would you have? It's much the same as anyone else because we're all up against the, the same obstacle. That is, we all have strong vishaya vasanas. So we are trying to wean our mind off its vishaya vasanas. And we, we manage to be self-attentive a little here and there, but we keep on failing and uh, allowing our attention to go outwards, and we just have to continue trying. So it's just a, it's all a matter of patient perseverance. Sometimes people used to ask Bhagavan, Bhagavan, how can we tell whether we're progressing in this spiritual path? Bhagavan said, the only sign of progress is perseverance. Because if you're persevering, Bhagavan, did, Bhagavan just left it at that. He said the only sign of perseverance is, is the only sign of progress is perseverance. Why did he say that? Because perseverance is the measure of our love. If we truly love to know what we actually are, to surrender this ego and know what we actually are, we will persevere in this simple practice of self-attentiveness. So to the extent we are persevering, to that extent we are progressing.
Mm-hmm. More than that, there's nothing to say because the people say, ah, I was practicing self-investigation and I had such and such an experience. Whatever experience we have is something other than ourselves. It's something that came, comes and goes. So it's not ourselves. So we are in <laughs> self-investigation, we are not looking for any experience. We are trying to find the truth of the experiencer. Who am I to whom all experiences occur? So we should not allow ourselves to be distracted or to attach any importance to any experience. Yes, on the way, so many experiences may come and go, but it's all a dream. So why should we attach any importance to any experience of any kind whatsoever? So everything, and that is everything that's happening in the mind, in the waking state, is pretty much uh, it's of no consequence because it's, it's no, all it's part all of dream. the dream. It's all a dream. Okay, that's so. Anything which pretty much comes is inconsequential in some ways. Whatever appears is not real. Because what is real must always be, that is, as Bowen said, if something exists at one time and not at another time, it doesn't actually exist even when it seems to exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is it that exists always? Only I am. So that alone is real. Even this ego is not real because it, it appears in waking and dream, it disappears in sleep, so it cannot be real. But in that I am, that ego is that mixed awareness, I am this body. So in ego, though ego itself is unreal, there is a real element in it. That is that fundamental awareness, I am. That is what is real. That is what we should cling to. Um, the other question, Michael, since the self is infinite, right? Mm -hmm. That means there's nothing which is excluded yes. in the self, right? Yes. That means this body is part of the self and the mind is part of the self. Um, no, to say it's but part, could you speak because to that? It, mm -hmm. infinite, means, infinite means without limit. Yeah. Being without limit means not only being without external limits, also internal limits. So if something is divided, it is thereby limited because it's got internal division. The internal the divisions are internal limitations. So what is truly infinite is not only uh, without any limit outwardly, it's got no internal limit, so it's indivisible. So what we actually are are uh, is it infinite, eternal, indivisible, and immutable. So it never undergoes any change. So this body, this world, are all appearances. They don't actually but exist. But in the infinite, however, it is part of the infinite. If then then we are implying that the infinite has parts, it doesn't have parts. It is into it's it's partless. They are just appearances. Would you would you say the the uh, the snake is a part of the rope? It's not at all. It's got nothing to do with it. It's just an appearance. There is no ah. snake there at all. Ah. But okay, the that was very point is. Analogy. Everything is an appearance, but mm -hmm. to whom does it appear? That is what we need to investigate. That's why this, this, this clue Bhagavan gave us to whom, it is such an important, both as a practical clue and as a philosophical clue, because you can defeat, you can, you can undermine all philosophy with this simple question. That is, everything, there are so many things seem to exist. But to whom do they seem to exist? Only to me. So who am I? So ultimately, everything comes back only to I. Michael, that was just, that That just um, was, you know, it really, that example that you gave, the snake versus the rope. Yes. Just, you know, with like a light bulb going in <laughs> well, my head. It's not me who's giving you that know, analogy. It's an angel's analogy. That was just analogy, beautiful, but, very yeah, appropriate. Yeah, so yeah. my question is, 
once you see the rope, the you know it's not the snake, right? Because you know there you never was a snake. That, that there never was a snake. I have experienced self, but why um, the appearance of the world is then not growing? Like once you see the rope, you know there never was a snake. Why that is not happening as clearly? There is never a moment when what, what you call the self. Actually, there's no term in uh, Tamil or Indian languages for the self. Firstly, because they don't have definite articles like the. And secondly, people write self with a capital S. There are no capitals. The term Bhagavan used in Tamil was tan. Tan simply means oneself. And the Sanskrit word Atman means the same. It means oneself. So it is not, when we say the self, we we sort of make it, we, we reify it, we make it into a thing. It is nothing but ourself. So we alone actually exist. Everything else is an appearance. But to whom does it appear? It appears only to us as ego, not to our real nature. What we actually are, for what we actually are, there is no appearance. So it's only when we rise as ego, which is that what we actually are, the pure awareness I am. When this pure awareness is seemingly mixed with adjuncts and experiences itself as I am this body, that is that not the pure awareness never experiences itself as I am this body. Some some spurious entity, some formless phantom, as Bhagavan calls it, called ego, rises as the extent of a body. It borrows from from the pure awareness, from Satchit, it borrows the awareness I am. And from the body, it borrows a form. And it conflates these two together and experiences itself as I am this body. This spurious form entity, this formless phantom, is what is called ego. Has anyone ever seen ego? No. We seem to be ego only so long as we're looking at other things. But if we look at ourselves, there's no ego to be found. That's why Bhagavan said, in verse 25 of Uludhanapadu, Tedinal Otum Pidikon. If sought, it takes flight. So we seem to be ego so long as we're looking at other things. If we look back at ourselves to see who am I, ego will, uh, will disappear because it doesn't actually exist. The snake seems, uh, the rope seems to be a snake only when we're not looking at it sufficiently carefully. If we go close and look at it carefully, we'll say, oh, it's just a, a rope. Likewise, when we are looking away from ego at other things, we seem to be ego. If we look caref very carefully at, this, at ego, we will find nothing but pure awareness. So since the root of all, all, everything that appears, appears only to ego. And ego, to whom does ego appear? Only to itself. So if we investigate ego, ego will dissolve and all appearances will be found to be ever non-existent. There never was so any appearance, there and never mind. was anyone to whom anything could appear. And then body would also the bo the be irrelevant is, if yeah, there the is body no body exists ego. only in the view of ego. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the mind, right? And so mind, what, yeah. but what is watching the mind? Like when I'm meditating, I can see the mind. That's the self, right? Mind, we need to be clear about what we, that the word mind is a, a, a tricky word because it's used, in, it's used not in different contexts to mean different things. In verse mm -hmm. 18 of Upadesha India, Bhagavan has said, Enengale manam, that means thoughts alone are mind. So gen, that is generally, we take mm -hmm. thought, we use the term mind as a collective name for the totality of all thoughts, all mental phenomena constitute mind. But of all thoughts, uh, as he says in this verse 18 of Upadeshunya, of all thoughts, the root is the thought I, the thought called I. What he means by the thought called I is ego. So all other, all other thoughts are objects. Ego is the subject. So all other thoughts exist only in the view of the uh, ego, the subject. So 
what the mind, so Bhagavan concludes by saying, therefore, what is called mind is I, meaning what is called mind is nothing but ego. So what the mind essentially is, is ego. That is, our, our first thought, the root of all other thoughts is this ego, the thought called I. When we rise as ego, all other thoughts are just phenomena that appear within our aware, with, within our view. So nothing else, no other thought exists independent of ego in whose view it seems to exist. So what the term mind essentially refers to is ego. So generally when Bhagavan used the term mind, he was using it as a, as a um, synonym for ego. He's talk, but Bhagavan isn't concerned with the objective aspects of the mind, with their other thoughts, but they're all objects. Bhagavan's concerned only with the subject. To whom do all these other thoughts appear? To me. That me is the first thought, I. That is the ego. That is what we need to investigate. So when Bhagavan talks about investigating the mind, he doesn't mean investigating other thoughts. He means only investigating this first thought, I. So there, there are many, um, there are so many different types of meditation. And one type of meditation, people say, you should, you should just observe your thoughts and be a detached witness. That may be useful at a very superficial <laughs> level, but that's a very superficial form of type, type meditation. Bhagavan said, what does it matter however many thoughts are, appear? To whom do they appear? Investigate that. So we, have, we are not in the least concerned about our thoughts. Let them appear or let them not appear. It's not our, no business of ours. We, our only concern is to attend to ourselves, the first thought I. So pretty much it doesn't matter what the outward focus is. Nothing matters. They're just interested in the whole, that and focus on... The whole on problem that. is that we attend to things outside. All, all problems are caused by our looking outside. If we look within, all problems will be solved. So we so what are, to attend so again, only to ourselves and not to anything else. It's so useful. Yeah. And and the biggest challenge is really seeing that clarity, right, Michael? That you could really know this is the rope, not the snake. Yes, yes. For that, you need to look at the snake very carefully in order to see that it's just a rope. Likewise, we need to look at ourselves very carefully. All clarity will come only from looking within. And here the, the more snake we look out, that we... the more we get confused. The more we look in, the clearer everything becomes. But uh, the snake here is the body, thoughts, and the external world, right? We. We can apply this analogy in different ways. Yes, the whole external world, all phenomena are the snake. That's one way of taking it. But a deeper, mm -hmm. more practical way of taking it, to whom do all these things appear? To me, to ego. So let's, if we take ego to be the snake, then if we look very carefully at that snake, we'll see it's only a rope. If we look very carefully at other thoughts, at the, at phenomena, we will just see more and more phenomena. The more you investigate uh -huh. objects, the more you find objects. If we want to find the truth, we don't look at objects, we look only at the subject. So it's pretty much to whom it's appearing, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Because it's... nothing, no objects can exist independent of subject. Without your subject, there are no objects. So the mm -hmm. objects have no independent existence. They borrow their seeming existence from ego, the perceiver of them. And ego borrows its seeming existence from I am. So let us attend only to I am and forget everything else. That is the sum and substance of Bhagavan's teaching. That's all there is to it. Everything that Bhagavan taught us is aiming only at this. Bhagavan didn't, whatever Bhagavan taught us, it had a practical implication. That is, if we understand what he taught us correctly, Everything he taught us is pointing us back towards ourselves. To whom is all this? Mm -hmm. Why is it so difficult, though? Um, because we have so much. <laughs> we, because, because of the strength, because we have more love for other things than we have for ourselves. 
for ourself means ourself as we really are. Now we love this little person we take ourselves to be, but all this is other than ourselves. Everything about this person, this person is just a, an image in our dream. This person is coming in the way pretty much for us to The do. person is not the problem. Don't blame the person. Ego, no says, ego. If ego is the problem. Ego is not the person. Ego is yeah. that which takes this person to the eye. So oh. it's only ego we need to be concerned about. So that's the big part. Yes. That yes. this body's yes. eye. That is the ego part. That is ego. Body is innocent, but we can't blame the body. It's the ego who says this body is I. So ego is the culprit. So ego is the one who needs to be dealt with. And how do we if, deal with ego? Ego flourishes and gets on fine so long as it's looking away from itself. If it turns back to look at itself, it dissolves and disappears. So the only way to deal with this though, is to turn our attention back within to cling firmly to self-attentiveness. So, Michael, if that ego thought I goes away, yes. the body still remains, right? Yeah. For whom? My For whom? To whom, do, to whom can but anybody... It'll still exist. Of... It'll Look. still exist, right? To whom? When you say it exists, according to Bhagavan, it doesn't self. exist even now. Does your does the body you took to be yourself in a dream, does that exist now? It never actually no. existed. It just seemed to exist. Likewise, this body doesn't actually ah. exist. It doesn't actually exist. As Bhagavan said, whatever exists at one time and not at another time doesn't actually exist even when it seems to exist. There's a simple reason for that. Whatever actually exists is intrinsically existent. Because it's intrinsically existent, it cannot cease to exist. But whatever comes into existence and ceases to exist is not intrinsically existent. So it is a borrowed existence. So the, the body and the world, they seem to exist, but they borrow their seeming existence from ego because it's only in the view of ego that they seem to exist. Without ego, they don't exist at all. They don't even seem to exist. So, so they borrow their seeming existence from ego, and ego borrows its seeming existence from I am. A simple analogy. Supposing you've got some, uh, some hot rice. Is rice intrinsically hot? No, it's not. It's, so because it's not intrinsically hot, it's borrowed its heat from somewhere else. It's derived its heat from boiling water. So is the water intrinsically hot? No, it's not. It's derived its heat from a hot pan. And is the pan intrinsically hot? No, it's derived its heat from the fire. Is the fire intrinsically hot? Yes, because whenever there's a fire, it's hot. So, what is intrinsically existent is only ourself. So, we alone actually exist. Because, we, it, because we're intrinsically existent, we never cease to exist. But everything else, including ego, is not intrinsically existent. It, ego borrows its seeming existence from ourself, from I am. And other things borrow their seeming existence from ego because they seem to exist only in the view of ego. So when ego is annihilated, what remains is what alone actually is, which is one without a second. Ekameva advaitiam, as they say in the So then Shastra. there's no body, there is no mind. No once body, the no I mind, nothing, nothing, away. nothing. All these other things are all appearances and they appear to whom? Only to ego. So investigate ego, we find there's no such thing as ego, therefore there's no world. That is why the ultimate truth is a jata. <laughs> so, Michael, could you also talk about what Atma and Paramatma you touched about? A a atma means oneself. Often the word Atman is used to refer to our real nature which is what Bhagavan generally referred to as Atma Swarupa. Atma Swarupa means, the re Swarupa means real nature. Atma Swarupa means the real nature of oneself. 
So, but then it should be one thing. Why it's uh, individual atma and the paramatma? Okay, well, in different texts, there these terms are used in different senses. Um, uh, uh, the, in, the ego is sometimes referred to as jiva or jivatma, that the individual self. Our real nature is sometimes referred to as paramatma, the supreme self. But how many selves do we have? We are only one self. We are not two. So there's only one. We are one. When we remain as what we actually are is only that fundamental awareness, I am. That is such it. That is Brahman, that is Atmosarupa. When this pure awareness I am is seemingly mixed with adjuncts, as I am this body, I am this person, that is called ego. That is called Jivatma. So we can say, I am is Paramatma, I am this body is Jivatma. But these are all just terms. Let's not worry about the term. The problem is, why do we call it jivatma or ego or mind or whatever? It doesn't matter. It's a false awareness of ourself. So how to get rid of a false awareness of ourself? Only by correct awareness of ourself. What is the correct awareness of ourself? Just I am. I am this or I am that is false. I am alone is real. That's why Bhagavan said the ultimate experience is not I am Brahman or I am that or I am this or that. The ultimate experience is only I am I. That is, I am nothing other than I. Because there is nothing other than I. I alone is what actually exists. Wow. Michael, is there any other thing you would like to share which would be beneficial? Um, for those people on this journey? What we've talked about today is the very heart of Bhagavan's teachings. If we grasp the heart, nothing else mm -hmm. is necessary. Mm -hmm. okay. If we allow we... our mind to go outwards, we can go on asking endless questions and it, it, there's no end to it if we allow the mind to go outwards. That is the... the the significance of the story of the appearance of Arunachala as this column of fire. Brahma went flying as a swan, looking, trying to look for the top. Brahma mm -hmm. there represents intellect, the outward going intellect, the outward going mind. So he went out and out and out. He couldn't find the top. So he finally had to come back with a lie. Vishnu, on the other hand, represents ego diving deep within. So he... As the ego, as Krishna burrowed deeper and deeper trying to find the foot, he became more and more humble when he understood it was our foolishness that we thought that we are the greatest. There is one who is greater than all of us because we have forgotten Shiva. Because we have forgotten I am, we got into all this mess thinking I am the greatest. So, so it, allowing our mind to go outwards leads to endless... There's no end to what we can what we can question and what there are all the, there are plenty of answers are out there. Science is every day finding more and more answers, but the more answers it gets, the more questions it gets. So <laughs> yeah. that's not the way to go. We are going in the opposite direction. So we are for this to turn within. There's only one question we need. We can express it in two ways because essentially they're the same question. Either if we're looking outside and we see all these things, to whom are all these things? When we turn back within, the only question is, who am I? Actually, they're just two sides of the same question. To whom and who am I? They're the same thing. Our turning of our attention away from other things back towards ourself, that is the significance of what Bhagavan, of the, of the clue that Bhagavan gave us, to whom. That is why Bhagavan said to whom? In order to turn our attention away from other things back to ourselves. Once we've turned our attention back to ourselves, to whom becomes is no longer necessary. All that is necessary is who am I? In other words, we attend only to ourselves. Having left, having ceased attending to other things, we remain attending only to ourselves. That is to whom turning and remaining turned is who am I? 
So that's the, those are the only two questions we need. No other questions are necessary. All other teachings Bhagavan gave us is just to turn us back towards this core teaching. Because it's the nature of the mind to come out with, Bhagavan had to give us other teachings. He had to teach us about the law of karma and all these things. These are all necessary only when we allow the mind to come outwards. If we don't allow the mind to come outwards, nothing other than who am I is necessary. And who am I is not a question. It is just looking to see what we actually are. And when we are established in that, um, I think the biggest worry ego brings up is then how will you function? Who, what is functioning? Body, speech, and mind are functioning. Let them function according to prarabdha. That is not any concern of ours. Why should we want to function at all? How do we function in sleep? We don't function at all. We're perfectly happy without functioning. So our aim is to remain without function. Functioning means doing. What we are is only being, not doing. Doing is false. Being is real. So it's so, again ego, so our, which our, is... Our aim is to renounce all functioning, all doing, and to remain as just being. Mm 